I'd like you to talk a little bit about more about Spinoza. You just said that this is where he, where his philosophy comes in, but explain to us what Spinoza's philosophy says. Well, that's a very big question, but Spinoza came into my life when I was um, basically a high school kid, and I started reading about classical philosophy and so forth, and I found this very strong resonance with this philosopher. So when I was a philosophy student at the university in Sweden, I just really clicked with Spinoza, and I started to see that he provided something that has been culturally very overlooked, historically. And we saw that the traditions of reductionism, of approaching problems in isolation and compartmentalizing all kinds of things, this is a tradition that goes back to Rene Descartes and Francis Bacon. But Spinoza, who was also active around the same time, he basically provided an answer moving things in a very different direction, looking at the world as a unified whole, as a unified system, and understanding how those functional relations provide context and contextual understanding of why things are relevant and how things are interconnected. So I saw that Spinoza was a really important piece in understanding sustainability. And I also see that there are strong links between this kind of monistic or some people call it holistic philosophy, but I try to steer clear of that term for several reasons. And I also think that Spinoza would have done that as well. But um, in the Eastern philosophies, we also see this understanding of the world as a unified whole rather than just bits and pieces. And also ourselves being interconnected with these things around us and with each other in ways that we many times don't really focus on in the Western context. And this has come down to us also through our educational systems that have kind of taken in these reductionistic philosophies that disregard the world as a unified whole. You're interested in implementing functional change in the world by educating people differently and, and, and having them come out as adults in the professional spheres and practicing these ideologies that hopefully would have been built into them or rather supported into them from youth and they could approach problem solving in the, in the real world in this, in this newer, wider way. Yes. Uh, but, um, isn't the complexity of the world and all its connections, uh, even as Spinoza sees it, too complicated for problem solving? Because isn't problem solving something that involves a problem and a solution? Yes, very good point. Well, Spinoza says that we need to understand that we can never understand everything about any given complex system. We can never know everything. Because in order for us to understand everything, we would need to know all the connections that all these parts in this system have amongst each other and to everything else in the rest of the universe. And this is something that is impossible. But Spinoza says that instead of focusing on trying to achieve that perfect understanding, that perfect knowledge, which is a very Cartesian notion of knowledge, where we need to map everything, we need to build the perfect model or the perfect description. Instead of doing that, we need to strive for sufficient knowledge, sufficient understanding. So Spinoza explains that we instead need to look at the interconnections of things and how they are functionally related, because that gives us the understanding of why things are relevant in a given context and also what is appropriate in a given context. So when it comes to sustainability, understanding this from a systems perspective requires that we understand how parts and holes are interrelated and why certain things become problematic, why things become non-sustainable. And if we approach this in a non-systemic way, we don't really make sense of these things. We might see that we have waste problems, we have all these kinds of environmental problems or social problems, but we don't really connect the dots. And we are ill-equipped to connect those dots historically and philosophically here in the West. So. Thinking about these terms differently is the start. But you're right, problem solving pre kind of conditions us to thinking in the way that we need to really define the problem very clearly and we need to solve it very definitely in a very definitive way. But Spinoza's view also ties in with a more soft systems approach, which is also something I integrate in my education. And that is an approach where you see systems and all these things rather as social constructs 
and as models that we can build of how the world functions. And we don't need to build perfect models, but we need to build models that explain things appropriately in their given context. So by doing this and by becoming better at doing this, we can move our understanding in the right direction and learn in the process. So instead of really being stuck in this Cartesian notion of having to know everything, we can learn and we can move in the right direction. But of course that is challenging also because when it comes to sustainability, it's difficult to even know what is the right answer. So we need to be really humble about this and also understand that we need to learn in a cyclical way, in a process. Uh, that's right, because when you say context, uh, you're basically saying you have to understand it, maybe not the whole environment perfectly, but your context pretty well. So that, to me, that sounds like the same kind of problem. Yes. Because now you have to know your context. And it's full of connections, too. So. And the key when it comes to sustainability education is to make the student connected. Because if you don't feel that you are connected to the context you're trying to understand and you don't understand in what sense you relate to this, then you do not feel that you're part of this. But as soon as students, students feel that they are connected, that this is relevant to them, and that they matter, and also that changes they make or actions they take, that these things really matter because all things are interconnected, then they can have this functional understanding that they as individuals have the power to actually change things and become examples. So I've seen that this has been a very powerful key, this transformative dimension of education where students really feel that they get a reorientation of how they see themselves. Um, talk about a little bit about intuition. You've mentioned it in some of your lectures. What is the function and value of intuition in working um, to solve systems problems? Very good question, yes. Well, as I see it, we need to have an emotional connection if we are to really engage our gears with any kind of real problem solving or any real problems in the real world. So we need to feel that this is emotionally important to us. And in the Western education system and also in the philosophical traditions we have here, we're very stuck on quantifiable, rational answers and so forth in the very Cartesian sense. But Spinoza actually says that the higher form of understanding is intuitive because it comes from a true awareness of how things are interconnected. And this is something that relates to how we are also, as individual beings, interconnected amongst each other and with the rest of the world. And we don't necessarily need to know all these things in a very rational, quantified sense. But if we truly connect to who we are within, then we can have an intuitive awareness of how things relate and how things matter. But still, it's somewhat unclear what Spinoza meant when he talked about intuition. But as I see it, students become very creative when they start meshing gears with things and they get this experience of being well, transformationally kind of engaged with the problems, not just learning things or squeezing it in in a mental way. And the intuitive sense, as I see it, is this guiding feeling almost that we have from within. And it has to do with who we really are. And we need to listen to that, because if we really connect with that, it just feels wrong to waste. It just feels wrong to destroy natural environments, because it cuts across the grain of who we truly are. That's my philosophy, and that's what I also see in students, that if things are only staying in the strictly mental, mentally focused, quantifiable, learning facts kind of realm, then you don't see the transformation in students. And most of the time, they are not asked to be intuitive. They are not asked to be creative, but rather to get the cookie cutter from somebody else. So I think we have a lot of guidance from within ourselves if we learn to listen to it, because in the real world, we are all interconnected, and we need to relate to that aspect of ourselves. And that's where the intuition comes in. In your lectures, you've cited a lot of scientists and writers, Einstein and poets, uh, who appear to share the kinds of sentiments that you advocate for education, for self-awareness, and for the functionality that this fosters in the world once we're adults and able to implement change. So can you can you talk about why it's important for you to, to, to cite not just systems scientists 
we're just mm -hmm. philosophers. Yes. But, but people from the hard sciences, yes. people from business who, who have made those connections. Why do you introduce these uh, citations into your lectures? Well, hopefully this gives students a bit of context as well. And, I mean, we have a lot of people that have been thinking a lot of good things. Now we need to put it to practice. So by putting these things in context and showing why they are relevant, I mean, we can learn a lot from these things. But I also see that involving art, involving more romantical or spiritual sentiments can sometimes be a very good trigger to, I mean, for the creativity. So that's where the poetry comes in.